Hi and welcome to a new video. Today we will talk about shunt modding once again. A lot of people will probably say, again, this topic, we've heard about that um, a thousand times already and I would agree, but we are going to do a variable shunt mod, which means that you can actually adjust the power readout while the card is running. And that is particularly interesting for extreme overclocking because in several conditions, especially with liquid nitrogen, there's often the scenario where you're in a region where the typical like solid shunt mod, which might reduce your power reading by 50%, is not sufficient because you're increasing voltage and also the frequency during the run maybe. And this is also increasing power. And then your typical conventional shunt mod might not be sufficient anymore. And this is a very, very elegant solution by Elmore. And we're going to try it in today's video. Sonic, the heart of your system. Before we start with the mod itself, a quick look in GPU-C. I've been running this for about 15 to 20 minutes in the background just to make sure that we're hitting stable temperatures and clocks and everything. The clocks are typically in a range between 1770 MHz and 1830 MHz, which is what you can see like just scrolling uh, through the frequency. GPU temperature is not going to be that relevant. It's going to be more relevant to check out the fan speed because if we increase the power consumption of the GPU, it's more likely that the fans will spin higher instead that we're seeing an increased GPU temperature. So we're going to remember 1940 RPM on the GPU fan speed. And if we check the power consumption itself, it's at 100% TDP and the perfect cap reason is power right here. Board power draw is right now about 260 watt. So we're looking at the 2080 Ti without the cooler, as you can see, just for orientation, we have the 12 volt input coming from the GPU. It will flow like right through here, going through our power stages, which will transform together with those uh, inductors and the caps, the 12 volt to our, let's say one volt vGPU voltage and the GPU will just sit right here. And here we have the shunt resistors marked with R005, both of them. And in this case, the indication with R005 means that it's 5 milliohm. The way the shunt resistor works is very simple. It's just following Ohm's law. So for example, you have 12 volt input from your PSU, like to the connectors on top. Then you have the resistor sitting underneath with a resistance of 5 milliohm. And then for example, we can take a current which is flowing across the resistor of 10 amps and 10 amps is like a very realistic value I would say and in the situation where you have 10 amps uh, flowing across the resistor with a resistance of 5 milliohm you have a voltage which is dropping on the resistor by 50 millivolt and then you can simply read out this voltage which is um, occurring across the resistor which is 50 millivolt read it out and and a, and a simple IC can do the math and calculate the power draw power consumption of your card. So what we did in the past is we had those shunt resistors and then we simply added the same resistor type on top. So for example, five milliohm resistors, or we could also take uh, those uh, three milliohm resistors, just depending what kind of um, eventual power readout we were looking for. So let's just take the example of adding one five milliohm resistor on top, then it equals uh, resistance because we are having two resistors in parallel, it just equals two times five milliohm will be 2.5 milliohm equal. And then the readout instead of 50 millivolt, it just would be 25 millivolt, which equals a readout of only 50% TDP compared to the 100% TDP we had before. Now Elmore came up with this brilliant idea. It's also a very simple part. As you can see, it's just a PCB. It's an Elmore power limit modifier. And it's basically a P-channel MOSFET sitting on a tiny PCB for easier soldering and we have one tiny connection on the bottom right for an external resistor. Going to talk about that in a second. Just for size comparison reasons, I added the five milliohm resistor and then we can see if we put this next to each other, this will fit perfectly. If we want to basically solder this on top of the resistor, that should work out very well. You might now think, why are we replacing something so simple like basic resistor with something more complex like a MOSFET transistor? In the end, a MOSFET is also a very simple transistor. You might all know the bipolar transistor from school, like those PNP and PN transistors, which are controlled over a current. And a MOSFET is basically the same thing. 
only that it's not controlled over a current, it's controlled over a voltage. And that's what we need in our very specific case. And that's also the reason why we are using a P-channel MOSFET. Basically, we're attaching our MOSFET between our shunt resistor, which is attached to 12 volt. And now our P-channel MOSFET is controlled over a negative gate voltage. Negative gate voltage now might also sound like complex, like why are we talking about negative voltages? But negative voltages are only a matter of perspective, like at which point are you measuring from? And for example, in relation to our 12 volt, the ground might sound like a negative voltage. Like if we consider our 12 volt as like zero volt, for example, then our ground is minus 12 volt. It's that simple. And now if we attach also an adjustable resistor in between our ground and our gate, then we, we can adjust the voltage accordingly and also this way control our MOSFET. So in this case, our MOSFET can just work as an adjustable resistor. Now you might also ask, why are we not directly adding like uh, those tiny adjustable resistors, those blue ones uh, between the shunt resistor? The problem is that those cannot handle any kind of current. They can handle like, I don't know, 0 0.1 amps or whatever, best case, maybe one amp, and that's it. And they cannot be controlled in such a like, tiny resistance as what we need on the shunt resistor because we're talking about milliohms and those you cannot adjust them as fine as what we need. But if you look at the data sheet of a MOSFET, then you will find the RDS on, like the resistance in the situation where the MOSFET is switched on. And depending on your gate voltage, you will have a different resistance of the MOSFET. Now this chart is showing RDS on, so the internal resistance of the MOSFET while it's switched on in relation to the variable resistor which we are soldering between the gate and ground. For example, let's just start on the x-axis. On the bottom left, we have 18,000 ohm. And if you go up on the y-axis, you will see it equals RDS of about 18 milliohm, which is fairly a lot to what we're usually using for shunt resistors. But if you're following down the line, let's say we're adjusting our resistor to 2000 ohm, then this will equal an internal resistance of the MOSFET of 4 milliohm. Our blue thing right here is our adjustable resistor. And we will only need two out of those three pins. Always, if you measure the outside pins, it will show the maximum resistance of the resistor itself, because you're measuring the total resistance, which should be 50 kilo ohm, kilo ohm which, uh, which is what we just saw. And what you're doing by adjusting this knob, you're always adjusting just the relation between the middle pin and the outside pins. So for example, the resistance between the middle and the bottom one would be 10 kilo ohm, then the relation between the top and the middle one would be 40 kilo ohm, which also means that we're only we only need one pin. That's just to keep things simpler. That's also what I usually did if I did my volt mods, just to be sure that I'm not mixing up things. So we're just checking the resistance on this resistor right now between the middle and the outside pin. So that's uh, 32 kilo ohm. And now we can just adjust the knob, turn it clockwise to decrease the resistance between those two. It's 25 kilo ohm going to increase it a little bit further because we're aiming for those 18 kilo ohm which we saw in the chart. 21, just a bit more and then yeah 18 kilo ohm should be good to go. So the next step is soldering our PCB with a MOSFET in parallel to the shunt resistor on the card. It will be 12 volt input from the right side, 12 volt output on the left side and the tiny contact point which we see on the bottom right will be attached to one of um, either of those pins, doesn't matter because those resistors don't have any polarity and the other pin will be connected to any ground point on the PCB of the VGA. I can just recommend to preheat the PCBs prior to soldering, maybe just put it in the oven at like 80 degrees Celsius, preheat it maybe with a heat gun at the point where you can see the flux is getting more fluid then should be a good temperature, otherwise there's so much copper inside those PCBs that it's really not that easy to solder just sometimes. Alright, let's add the power limit modifier on top, just like that. Just make sure that the input is pointing upwards, just the correct direction. Then we're going to solder. Adding some flux on the back of the PCB and adding a little bit of solder will definitely make things easier for the soldering process. Same goes for the shunt resistor itself, just add a bit of solder on those contacts on the top.
Meanwhile, I added the cables to the resistors, the included cables, and we have to add one side to the power limit modifier to the empty pin on the top right side, and then the other side of the resistor goes to ground somewhere on the PCB. Could use one of those pin headers, use one of those empty pins right here. Actually, we could even just use a ground on the fan connector, that would also work, but I think this won't work. Probably too big. Actually, that works. Not even mad. So we can use that. Should be simple. Now in the end also added some captain tape just to simply secure our wires in case we're just getting stuck to the wires or whatever so we don't rip it off immediately. Added the resistor output to our ground. And now time to add the cooler back on and then we should be good to go. If you want to do this like a permanent solution, you can obviously rethink doing this with like external cables or adding the resistors directly on here, having like short cables to ground, whatever. There are multiple solutions how you can make this more elegant and less messy. Initial check if everything is still up and running and you might notice that I swapped out the riser cable because on my first boot, I had a blue screen immediately with like NVIDIA driver, whatever thing. And then I thought, damn, did I kind of mess up? But then I figured out that my riser cable is uh, damaged probably. I mean, that's something that happens all the time. Riser cables are very, very sensitive. All right, so once we are done with uh, the initial test, by the way, the initial test looks good. So 3D Mark has been running for several minutes. All data looks all right. Obviously you cannot measure the resistance in circuit and absolutely you should not measure the resistance while things are powered on. That's something you absolutely cannot do. Like never measure resistance while things are powered on. That doesn't work. Uh, you might damage parts permanently. So, and also to measure the resistance of the VRs, um, like right now, because they're plugged into ground and we, you would measure in circuit. You would get completely different results. So if you want to adjust this from like 18K to let's say, 6k ohm, then we would have to unplug this from ground and then measure resistance, adjust and plug back in. In this state where we had about 18 kilo ohm on the variable resistance, which equals 18 milli ohm on the MOSFET, we should have like 18 milli ohm parallel with 5 milli ohm, which equals about 4 milli ohm as a resulting resistance. So there should be already some kind of influence, some kind of change. You can straight see there is an increase in clocks, maybe 70, 80 megahertz. Sometimes it's even peaking to like 1900 megahertz. So there's definitely an impact. However, if we look at the fan speed, you will notice it's basically the same as before. But then I also remembered that I just swapped the stock thermal paste to Cryonaut Extreme. That was maybe not the best idea. Well, I would say it's a good idea in general, but I should have swapped it before and then checked it afterwards because this way our comparison value on the fan speed is not really relevant anymore because we changed the thermal interface material, which is resulting in a lower GPU temperature, so it's not really comparable. But if we check the GPU voltage, this was previously always between 0 0.88, 0 0.92, and it's now going to 0 0.95 to 1 volt. So there's like a 70 to 100 millivolt increase in vGPU. So just again, as an example, if we measure in circuit, it's like 1.4 kilo ohm. So we will remove ground. And again, this will show up the first set 18 kilo ohm. And we will now adjust this to about 13 kilo ohm, which should result in a total resistance of the shunt of about 3 milli ohm, which should improve things further. One more hint while the card uh, is heating up and we're going to check the final results. At this point, if you want to especially adjust this while it's running, it might make sense to check how your adjustable resistor works. So for example, for those, I, che I checked if I do 10 rotations, it equals 18.6 kilo ohm. So one rotation is about 1.8 uh, kilo ohm. And if you keep this in mind, you just like check once the resistance while the system is powered off. And then for example, like right now, if the system is running, and we want to do further adjustments. We know, for example, we're doing two rotations. We know it's going to decrease the resistance by 3.6 kilo ohm. And then we can check the chart again and see what the resulting resistance should be. Maybe you're just asking yourself the question, why are we not just straight going for the lowest resistance and always running max out? This just doesn't work. 
there are some like fail safe mechanisms built in the card if the readout doesn't make any sense to the card then it will go into like a fail safe mode which results like 300 megahertz 400 megahertz permanently on the card and this will be there until you power cycle so sh shut down completely reboot and then it will be gone but if you boot up at a very low resistance on the shunt resistor you will most likely always run into the failure or like this fail safe mode and um, especially if you do like liquid nitrogen overclocking, a 2080 Ti can easily consume like 800 to 1000 Watt. And if you start up with like very low resistance on the shunt, you might straight run into failure mode. But if you want to go like very high on LN2 under load, then you can during the run increase it further if it's necessary. Now we can definitely notice a difference. It's permanently above 1900 MHz on the GPU. Definitely an impact on the fan speed with stock thermal pace probably like, I don't know, 2200, 2300 RPM. Definitely an impact and the GPU temperature, even though the fan speed increased, is also higher. On TDP, I actually thought it would be lower. So this means we would probably decrease this while it's, while it's running. Let's see what happens. Let's just tune them down. I'm going to do three rotations clockwise equals about five to six kilo ohm. Curious what will happen. So it's not that much that happened, but it's further increased on the GPU core clock, 1935. You can see in the perf cap reason, that was the region where I started tuning the resistor. So it's a lot less um, power as perf cap reason and you can see it also increased further in GPU voltage. It's now 1.04 basically constantly. To me this is definitely the most elegant way of doing shunt modding and uh, also considering the price a set of two like two PCBs with two adjustable resistors cables are just ten dollar. So it's pretty much a no-brainer and I think Definitely the best way to do shunt mods, especially if you compare that uh, to just doing the solid shunt mod where you add one resistor. I mean, that's fine for daily use, obviously, but uh, for like extreme overclocking, this is a much better solution because if you run into any kind of fa fail safe mode or whatever and you cannot really debug it, then you can just like shut down uh, power cycle, um, plug out, change the resistance, um, try over again. So it's a very, very nice and elegant way of doing the shunt mods. Obviously compatible not only to the 20 series, all the shunt mod supported cards like uh, 30 series, 10 series, they all work the same. All right, thanks for tuning in, see you next time, bye.